Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's episode is titled Water in the Middle East, Challenges and Solutions. We're pleased to be joined by Sarah Shields from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Uh, my name is Andy Mink. I'm the Vice President of Education at the National Humanities Center on behalf of our staff, Libby and Mike, as well as our graduate student interns, Hannah and Carly and Josh. I want to welcome all of you to tonight's session. Uh, we're getting to that point in the school year where uh, many of you are starting to see the, the end of the academic calendar year. Uh, I suspect that uh, your students are getting restless. You're probably transitioning either back into a face-to-face -face environment after a long time uh, teaching virtually, or perhaps um, or perhaps your, your students are have been with you face-to-face uh, -face for quite a while for the entire year, and you're feeling that, uh, that pull of the spring. We do appreciate you spending time after work uh, with us. Uh, we we appreciate that you've you've been with your students all day in some form or fashion, and that you've chosen to spend uh, another 90 minutes talking about this compelling topic. In particular, I want to welcome some of our guests that I see in the room tonight. Some for the first time, I think. Abra is joining us from Loveland High School. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's just to the northeast of Cincinnati, uh, not too far down the road. Aaron's with us. I'm sorry, Alexander's with us, who's at Ohio State in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, Peter's with us tonight. Peter's from uh, Shawshank uh, Valley Technical High School, which is in Billerica, Massachusetts. Um, hey, there's Jen down in Melbourne, Florida. Um, it's always great to have so many LAUSD teachers with us uh, tonight. That includes Alicia and Janet and Ashley. Rachel's reminding us that it's not so sunny in Southern California right now. And finally, yeah, listen, I, I appreciate the geography that all of you are representing, but all of us need to give a big high five to Aaron Aaron's joining us from home, uh, Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. Aaron teaches at the American School in Vietnam, and I'm pleased to see him back for another uh, Humanities in Class webinar uh, session. Uh, the center is, uh, is just like many of you, uh, entering this, this part, this, this back part of the academic calendar. Uh, our fellows are hard at work at their research. They have been uh, making do as best they can with the public health protocols and enjoying the um, the, the the, the, the sort of escape from all that at the center. Um, I do find, though, that when I uh, interact with fellows, both past and current, that there's always a very, very strong, um, strong interest and, and willingness to work with educators at all levels, work with K-12 teachers, work with post-secondary educators, and really add their lens, add their authority, add their experience and their, their knowledge, their deftness with the materials to understanding these complicated topics. If you look back now over our full webinar series uh, this year, I think you'll see that many of our sessions have featured other perspectives, different worldviews, trying to do it from a variety of, of, of different entry points so that you can then go back to your classroom better prepared to have difficult um, and sophisticated conversations. It doesn't necessarily mean that all of you will teach this in your curriculum standards. What it does mean is you will be a better prepared humanist and humanities educator if you understand some of the nuance of topics like the one that we'll discuss tonight. Uh, all the resources that we're sharing and resources you can find to support that approach are found in the Humanities in Class digital library. I would encourage you to use that library card actively and aggressively. That includes signing up for the webinar series group. This is where we'll, um, uh, before every webinar, place the pre-readings and the resources that have been pulled together in support of the session. Um, this is also a place where you'll be able to find the specific resource that's a, that has been provided by the scholar and by our TA to help you make that transition, make that uh, that transfer from this, this more adult conversation to uh, your professional work as a curriculum planner. Um, I hope you had a chance to review these uh, items. If not, you'll know that they're there and you can use them in reflection on the conversation that we have. In addition to that resource, though, you'll also find many resources from other humanities organizations. Uh, these are organizations that have joined with the National Humanities Center to make sure that their materials are free and open, to make sure that they're cross-discoverable so that if you type in keywords like Middle East or water or even interdisciplinary, you can begin to find resources that not only are in that humanities bandwidth, but may even include some STEM resources that will help you address these topics. We're really pleased to have over 80 organizations contributing at this point. These are organizations from uh, broad international uh, research centers and archives down to small local uh, university centers whose focus and specialize on different topics. One of those actually is with us tonight. 
I've invited Emma Harbour to uh, talk just a little bit about the materials that have been developed and are now available at the Duke UNC Center for Middle East and Islamic Studies. Uh, Emma's going to share just briefly some of the highlights of the work that they do. And while this is a North Carolina-based and university-based center, uh, their resources and their willingness to collaborate with educators all across the country will be pretty clear and pretty evident. So Emma, I'm going to invite you to unmute yourself and join me for a moment uh, uh, on the show and tell us a little bit more about the work that you do at the center. Thank you so much, Andy. It's really wonderful to be with all of you this evening. Um, and as one of our faculty affiliates, we work very closely with uh, Professor Sarah Shields and our programs for educators. And she is extremely knowledgeable and has a passion for public scholarship. So I know that you are in very good hands. And I'm sure that tonight's webinar is going to be excellent. I'm really looking forward to it myself. So as Andy mentioned, my name is Emma Harver and I'm the Director of Outreach at the Consortium for Middle East Studies at Duke University and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And through a competitive grant, our consortium has been designated by the U.S. Department of Education as a national resource center, and we provide reputable and relevant content about the Middle East on both of our campuses and to the public. Our outreach initiatives particularly focus on working with teachers and schools. And as Andy mentioned, though we are based in North Carolina, our content, resources, and programs have a national and even international reach. So I would like to just highlight a few of the ways in which we support educators and deepening their understanding of the, re of the region. Uh, we provide a variety of professional development opportunities that connect teachers with our faculty's expertise on wide ranging and interdisciplinary topics. Our programs range from summer institutes to full day workshops to study tours. And currently the majority of our programming is in the form of webinars. So all of you are welcome to join us online. I would also like to highlight our virtual exchange program entitled Teachers Collaborating Across Borders. And this is something we offer in partnership with the University of Arizona. And this is a unique opportunity for 18 teachers from the United States and 18 from the MENA region to participate in a year long virtual exchange program in which we discuss culture and education in our respective countries. We're actually opening applications for our next cohort of participating teachers next week, and we really welcome your applications. I'll share le links to these opportunities in the chat in a moment uh, so that you have direct access to what I'm discussing. And finally, I would just like to highlight our website at ncmideast.org, which you see on the slide, which houses a wealth of resources for teaching and learning about the region. Notably, we produce a multimedia series entitled The Middle East Explained, which features experts elaborating on a topic in about five to 10 minute videos. Um, and they're paired with a student learning guide for use in the classroom. And as Andy mentioned, many of our resources can also be found within the Humanities and Class Digital Library. So I really encourage you to make use of them there. I hope that you all visit our website and that you'll take advantage of our future offerings of professional development and reputable and relevant content on the Middle East. And please feel free to contact me with any questions. And again, I'll, I'll put some links in the chat for you all to explore further. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Andy. Thanks so much. Fantastic. But before you go, though, I've got one quick question for you. Sure. Um, you work with teachers all the time in, as you mentioned, both face-to-face -face and virtual environments. Uh, in, your own, in your own experience, just your own kind of feedback and observations over the last year, two years, three years, what seems to be the one topic that really is the gap or the need or that 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 topic that teachers really seem to want to understand about the Middle East generally? Oh, Andy, that's a that's a tricky question. Um, I mentioned we do a lot of interdisciplinary work. And so it depends really on the subject, I think, the course that our teachers are working with. So we get a lot of questions related to Middle Eastern history, uh, related to the the origins of the modern nation states of the region post-Ottoman Empire. We have questions about the environment, such as the, those that Professor Fields will discuss tonight. We get a lot of questions about religion and Islam, um, about women and gender in the region. Um, and so, yes, there, there is quite a wide range of topics and we work to address all of those. So these all of these hot button issues that people really have questions about, uh, we work to provide professional development in those areas. Yeah, thank you for saying that. You know, it, it doesn't surprise me that you said and sort of rattled through uh, very quickly those topics and they jumped to mind immediately. 
And it, it sounds to me like that could be a, a long, it could probably be five or six webinars. And of course, if any of our teachers took five or six webinars, they would get, let me, let me do the math, five times five, five times six, 30, 35 professional credit hours, all of which, by the way, does count for CEU credit and in LA counts for salary credit. Hey, Emma, guess what? You can also take an online course that you and I, our organizations have developed together. Thanks for the segue. Uh, I do want to encourage anybody to, who's interested in these topics to also uh, consider signing up for our online course. It'll be opening again in May, Understanding the Modern Middle East. And as it turns out, many, if not all of the topics that Emma just shared uh, as being these gaps and these needs, these really compelling topics that teachers uh, appreciate will be included in that five-week course. Um, we're at that point now, folks, where we've got uh, just a few webinars left after uh, over 40 this year. We've got nine left after tonight. And I do encourage you to go back and look at the calendar, sign up for some more webinars, share them with your uh, peers and colleagues if you like, uh, if you have interest in these topics. Could be that you're interested in the interdisciplinary nature of science and humanities, in which case uh, Professor Adamson and Michelle Zimmerman's uh, sessions would be in intriguing. Could be that you're interested in the Middle East and issues around understanding the Arab experience in America. And if so, you'll hopefully join us with Aram uh, Katter, past fellow uh, and current professor of history at North Carolina State. Please do go and sign up. We have just a few more left and we'd love for you to join us. Finally, I want to thank our Teacher Advisory Council for uh, being so heavily involved, particularly in this pandemic year. Uh, we have opened applications for next year's Teacher Advisory Council. Um, these will be due by May the 3rd, and we'll make decisions sometime in the middle of May. We'd love to have a wide variety of backgrounds and interests, geographies, and schools and districts and states that you can represent. We do see this as a very collaborative and benefic mutually beneficial uh, relationship, and I hope that, um, that many of you have a chance to apply and hopefully join us. As you know, if you've attended previous sessions, tonight's webinar, while it's audio and PowerPoint only, is very dependent on your interaction. That interaction will happen in the chat box. The audience chat box is indicated by arrow three. If you've got a question, though, that you'd like to ask specifically of Professor Shields, please do drop it in the uh, Ask Professor Shields uh, button tab, and I'll be sure as the moderator to bring that forward when the time presents itself. If you have any questions or any problems with the audio or with the uh, system, usually if you refresh your page, uh, it, it sort of reboots things. If you have to log out and come back in and it does not disrupt your attendance, please feel free to do that. But why don't you start by uh, cranking up your audio as indicated in arrow two to make sure that uh, the audio is clean and easy to hear. Once again, you have joined uh, the webinar series tonight. Uh, our session is titled Water in the Middle East, Challenges and Solutions. I'm joined by Professor and Director of Graduate Studies in the Department of History, Sarah Shields from the University of North Carolina here in Chapel Hill. She's also a past fellow at the National Humanities Center back in 2006 and 7. I want to thank and recognize uh, David Tao for joining us again tonight. David was our TA last week for the webinar on fire. Tonight he's completing his set, his pack, by uh, joining us for water. Uh, David is going to be dropping some links and some questions in the chat box. He's been curating some resources that he thought would be helpful for you as well. So with that, uh, Professor, I'd like to welcome you to uh, the webinar, uh, thank you for joining us and and turn the microphone over to you. Hi, Professor, can you hear me nearby in Chapel Hill? Uh, all the way down I-40, can you hear me? <laughs> all the way down I-40, that's right. We can, thank you so much for uh, for joining us. And, um, you know, it's funny, I, I asked Sarah, uh, Sarah, I asked Emma this question. I know you have done a lot of work with K-12 teachers in North Carolina and elsewhere. What seems to be the question you get the most? What, what do people, feel they're the most confused or interested by when you approach the Middle East and understanding the Middle East? Um, I think generally people want to know more about everything. As Emma suggested, there's, there's lots of confusion that their students are bringing in. And so a lot of it is just um, wanting more information. But there's also a, a sense that, um, that, that they need to disconnect politics, current politics, from, from in this region from what's going on in that region. Yeah, I can see that. And I suspect that many of our educators also, you know, have in the back of their mind that they've got to, in some ways, unteach or disconnect the conversation from those politics. And we appreciate your guidance tonight in helping us do so. 
Well, thank you. Um, I wanted to thank Andy and Emma and Libby, but mostly I want to thank all of the teachers who have spent hours and hours and hours looking at your screens for being here yet again to look at this screen um, and, and my slides. Um, I, I'm coming at this as a teacher. Uh, I've been I've taught now only three courses, three different semesters on water in the Middle East, and done a number of sessions, as Emma suggested, um, on for for K-12 teachers. I think that water is a great way to get students thinking more broadly. So I get uh, STEM students in this history class on water in the Middle East. Um, I find that teachers who are doing social studies or literature or science can bring them all together when they're talking about these sort of water issues. Uh, and when I did the last session with uh, Emma Harver and the Duke UNC program um, with teachers, I distributed a number of of images. They were maps. I've loved maps since I was in third grade social studies. And so these are a series of maps that tell stories. Um, and what I asked the teachers to do was try to figure out how they would use those with their students. And they worked in groups, each with a different set of maps, um, to try to narrate what they could tell about history, about water issues in the, in the recent past of the Middle East. Um, those are available uh, on in the readings for tonight. Um, I also have lots of links to the things that I use in my classes on these slides, short videos and, and things like that. Um, most of the images are linked to websites. And I would be glad to make these uh, this PowerPoint presentation, all of these slides available if anybody is interested. Um, and as we go, I want to hear about how water issues interest your students. This seems to me to be something that more than anything that I was interested in way back in the day when I was a uh, high school student or an, under, or, or an undergraduate student, um, water seems to be really compelling. Students understand that there are huge environmental issues at stake. And so, so um, they seem to be willing to do lots of really elaborate research. Uh, on water. And and that's the way I've, I've presented these classes. I've done three courses now. The first two focused on, on water and conflict, and the third focused on dams and the consequences of dams, which are myriad. Um, and the, the two uh, websites are available, I think, for you, but for sure on the on the um, on Emma's site um, for the Center for Middle East and Islamic Studies to see what the students have learned to do using GIS. One more thing by way of introduction, I was led to, to this uh, by my own daughter. Um, I was a, trained as an Ottoman historian and then I moved into the 1920s, the, the period we call, historians call the interwar period because um, it's between World War I and World War II. Um, she had become fascinated by water issues, a member of that younger generation, and during her master's in public health work, she had really focused on epidemiology and water, then came back to Chapel Hill, every mother's dream, to work at the UNC Water Institute. She was astonished. I, I mean, her shock was amazing that I could teach about the Middle East with, without ever talking about water. Um, and so my daughter challenged me and I started thinking about water and teaching water, thinking about water, and ultimately including it in the way I look at history. So I realized that that this is part of a continuum that historians do. So way back in the day, like when I was an undergraduate, historians talked about generals and presidents and kings and prime ministers. Um, and, and it was during the time that I was in graduate school, I'm going to tell you how old I am, that we started moving to history as political economy with Brodell and this notion that we don't have two different continents, Europe and Africa, but instead we have a Mediterranean um, society. And then people started looking at subalterns, the people who weren't the generals, but were their lesser officers and, and privates in the military. And, and each time we moved this viewfinder to look at um, uh, non-elites, to look at women, to look at people of color, um, what we found wasn't that the questions were different so much, but that 
we had we were developing a much more layered, nuanced, and complete sense of history. With my daughter's prodding, I've actually taken that a step further to look at environment. That it was sort of silly of me all of those years to assume that somehow what took place on land had nothing to do with land, and all that trade over the Mediterranean didn't have anything to do with water. Um, so now I've become a bit obsessed about water. So here we go. Today I've got this. This is happening in three parts. The first part, I'm going to make an argument that we need water and there isn't enough. The second is going to be um, human interventions in water are not neutral. And the third is going to relate to the question that uh, some of my students like to start with, um, how water and war related. Now, at this point, when I show this slide of the Fertile Crescent, which is obviously where most of us used to be taught anyway, that civilization as we know it began, I ask them why civilization would have required this kind of water. What do we use water for? And usually they'll start with survival and health and agriculture and leave it there. I'm getting some other uh, noises. Is that a problem for other people? Andy? I, I don't hear them. What, what kinds of noises? Uh, really interesting, like underwater noises. I, I really <laughs> didn't do this. Maybe okay. that's, that, I will that's, ignore it. that's the soundtrack for your, your water talk. Uh, oh, I right. Uh, All right. That sounds good to me. Uh, um, no, I, I think you can just move forward. I think it's okay. Thank you. Um, usually they don't think about these other things, how important water is in ritual and in philanthropy, the things that um, uh, are in that, uh, the article on um, the gardens that water ends up being, especially in Islamic society in the Middle East, really important as a way to show your faith. Um, philanthropy is really important and water is hard to come by. So building a water course or an urban fountain so people can get fresh water is really important. Um, industry requires water, uh, various extraction, it, extraction processes for mining require water, and the students can come up with an, a really extensive list that makes them understand how important water is. Um, there was a time while I was teaching the first round of this water course for a bunch of first year students who had just arrived at, at UNC, where I'm, I'm sure the Californians among us can, can identify with this, where the water shut off. There was no available water and all the water from the uh, shelves, all the grocery stores were gone. Um, the problem was that somebody had dumped too much chlorine in the local water, and so then we tried to get water from Durham, which is just down the road, but it's that Duke place, and so the water pipes burst in the middle of um, it wasn't even um, it wasn't even March Madness, so we ended up actually with no water, and the students came in two days later and said, "Wow." You know, we really take for granted that we have water, and water is very, very important. Um, and and I think that it was like teaching imperialism during the Falkland Islands crisis. There are certain times when what's going on in their lives and what you teach them about the past sort of intersect, and, and that was sort of an unfortunate intersection. So one of the things that we're talking about this semester with water in my modern Middle East class, not just a water class, is the question of aridity. One of the big problems in the Middle East, like in California um, and much of the, the Midwest, is that there isn't enough water. And, and you can see this, uh, this is hyper arid regions, uh, including some of my areas. And much of the rest of the Middle East that I'll be talking about um, tonight is uh, is water poor, even if not complete desert. Um, so the disputes have to do with uh, people who were writing 10 or 15 years ago saying, well, the problem is that there isn't enough water. And, and they talk about this Malthusian thing where we have to get rid of some of the population because they can never live in, in water, uh, water poor areas and things like that. And, and then the other people, um, historians and, and uh, activists and, and policy makers 
who say, well, actually, there is enough water if we use virtual water and if we pay close attention to how water gets used. Virtual water means importing water in the, in, in the form of food. So when we import watermelons, lettuce, um, cotton, uh, citrus fruits, we're arguably importing someone else's water. Um, in this country, it's often from California. I'm so glad the Californians are here. I'd love to see later in the chat um, how how this all relates to to what it's like living in a constantly arid place. The notion that aridity, that living in a desert, means that you can't have an economy is absurd if you've ever been to Las Vegas. I mean, the place is clearly very dry, and that hasn't changed um, the way its, its economy works. In addition to all of the basic agriculture and survival and things like that, one of the things that I talk about with the students is that the three monotheisms, all three faiths, have a really important element of water. Um, in, in all three, water and paradise, gardens and paradise are really connected. They certainly are, and, and I hope you have time to re read and see those spectacular images from that, um, that uh, uh, reading that, that I suggested. Um, for Jews, it's mikvah, the ritual bath. This one we saw just uh, about four years ago. It's in Sicily, actually, and it was a, a bath that's existed um, a Jewish ritual bath that had existed for centuries and centuries and centuries and was finally covered up to hide the continuing existence of Jew Jewish society um, around 1500 when the Jews finally had to leave the area. Um, but the Jewish ritual bath is still extremely important. This one, of course, is a famous um, image of uh, Jesus' uh, baptism by John the Baptist. The one on the bottom is a child doing voodoo. Um, each of these has links. The one to the child doing voodoo, which is the, the traditional required um, ritual cleansing before prayer for Muslims. Um, there's a, 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 a cartoon video for children about how Muslim children do voodoo. Um, so I encourage you to, to look through that. So if we think again about scarcity, um, I think it's important to recognize that people did water and agriculture really differently in the past, and it, to some it, to some degree in various places in the present. Um, this is from the World Bank. Good water resource management depends on good agricultural irrigation policies. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to make my screen bigger. There it is. Water withdrawals in the Middle East North Africa region represent 67% of renewable water resources. Um, one of the things that people have complained about, and you'll see that in the chapter on, on water from the uh, Norman Samuel book, is that people in the Middle East use 85% of all water available for agriculture. In California, they use 80%. Um, there's this fascination with how arid the Middle East is, but they seem to do a remarkable job in, in being efficient in a very non-Western way. So a few years ago, we were traveling in Morocco um, in the mountains, and this is what the the, the area looks like from the road. What you see is this big uh, row of palm trees um, and behind it some houses or some desolate uh, hillsides. What's really remarkable is that when you go into those palms, there's an extended set of gardens and fields that grow most of the food that the local population um, eats. And as you can see from the picture up there where many of the small children play. Uh, William Merriman took these photographs um, as well as the next one. Um, that shows the incredibly intensive agriculture 
taking place by diverting small streams and um, doing it all in a very shaded area, which is really different than extensive, non-intensive agriculture in desert zones. This is a kind of agriculture that has been created to um, minimize the amount of, of evaporation um, and use water directly on fields that, that, uh, that were needed at the time. So before I go on to talk about that second topic, human interventions and how they're not neutral, do you have anything that you that you can add to this? We'll take a moment and we'll let our audience uh, exercise their fingers, find their keyboard, and type any comments or questions that they'd like to ask you. Um, I can just go on if you all are if there, if there aren't any yet. Okay. Okay. So one of the other things that water is really important for in a desert region is uh, is transportation. Um, the Suez Canal here cut in half the time it took to get from London to the Jewel in the Crown. By going through the Suez Canal, um, they it took so much less time and was much more a secure route because it didn't go through the oceans. It went through uh, pretty well-bounded seas. Um, the opening of the Suez Canal was so important. Here's a way to connect science, geography, um, and music and history that the Khedib, the ruler of Egypt at the time, decided to commission an opera from Verdi. Um, and this has a link to that first set of images with the music playing in the, 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 the opera Aida, um, which is what Verdi came up with to celebrate the opening of this opera house, which coincides with the opening of the Suez Canal from which the Egyptians expected to get an enormous revenue. Um, this is a hilarious trailer on uh, the, the this major motion picture um, about this opening of the Suez Canal um, with uh, actors that you would recognize. And this map shows where Mecca is. One of the other things that's so important about waterways here is that uh, Egypt became one of the most important centers for the required pilgrimage, the Hajj, um, where most Muslims are supposed to go to Mecca during the year. This, it was uh, from Egypt, it was a, a waterborne um, pilgrimage. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about dams in the in the in the next couple of slides. The link that says Nile River is a really short clip um, of a, 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 a basic background to something my students have been really focusing on for the last two weeks, and that's the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Most of the water for the Nile begins in um, in in Africa, um, in the Horn of Africa, and will come up to Egypt through Ethiopia and the Sudan. Ethiopia is in the process of building a massive dam, and the Egyptians are really worried about it. And um, from Mubarak through Sisi, they've all threatened war if, if Ethiopia actually um, fills the dam, which Ethiopia has been doing. One of our own scholars here at UNC, the guy who's currently running the Water Institute, um, Aaron Salzberg, is one of the people who's been negotiating with Egypt, um, Ethiopia, and the Sudan to try to reapportion water rights because water is so important in this region. The Nile flood was the big deal every single year. Preparing for the Nile flood was hugely important. The Nile flood brought all kinds of sediment as well as water to, especially to the, um, the, the, this green area here, the wetlands and agricultural zones in Egypt. So human interventions here. Besides the Suez Canal, one of our librarians put together this map of dams in the Middle East. Um, each of those dots represents a dam that has been built by, built by one government or another in the region. The students worked on this site 
the human consequences of dams in the Middle East, what they did was using GIS, documented the, the effects that these dams would have on the populations and asked the questions about whether it would the dam would meet the requirements that had led to it being built. Um, and, and I really urge you to uh, look at these. It, they're GIS story maps, but they're also ArcGIS maps in them. So these students, again, in a history class, deal with history and geography and learn how to make maps. And some of them dealt with hydrology, like how far underwater would various cities go um, if, if when the dam was completed. One of the most controversial dams is the Ataturk Dam, which was the, one of the kickoff dams for this southeastern Anatolian project that we generally call GAP. Now, I wanted you to see where the GAP project is. It's all the way over here in the eastern part of Turkey. The rest of this area is not affected by this. But, but the dams, the dams are particularly on the Euphrates River. And so they influence everything all the water going into Syria and Iraq, as do as does the Tigris River. Um, so, one of the consequences of this has been to um, decrease the amount of water that's going, that's becoming available to people in in um, in Iraq and 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 Syria. Um, there's a terrific. I think I might not have uh, made it here, but a, a terrific film called um, Thirsting for War, which shows pictures of people in Syria right over the border here um, who have had their water disappear. So they're no longer able to do agriculture because the, the dam has really diverted the water into agri into this area and made it an agricultural zone. So it's been a real problem for Syria losing a lot of that water um, that had been available. The other problem, so one more thing about the water here in Syria, um, Syria and the rest of the region has had tremendous drought, like 15 years of drought. Um, and one of the worst years was 2008. And a combination of losing this ground, this, uh, this surface water, and the drought that wasn't replenishing the groundwater meant a tremendous agricultural problem for Syria, which tended to, to raise most of its own food, especially its own grain. Um, and some historians looking at things through a watery lens have argued that it's that lack of water which leads so many Syrians to leave the countryside and go to um, go instead to the outskirts of the major cities. And that it's those people who have been displaced, who have not very much to lose anymore, that began the uprising in Dara, um, which is one of those areas where a lot of people from this northern region settled. So it's not as though lack of water is a neutral notion in terms of the world stage. When when farmers lose water, I used to live in Kansas when we had serious water issues, there are big political, social, and economic consequences to, to the diversion of water or extended drought. But there are also social consequences of where dams are sited. So this is a picture of the town of Hassan Kaif. This town is 12,000 years old and a UNESCO World Heritage Site. When Turkey built this Ilusu Dam, which it just completed and has, uh, has filled um, just in the last few years, various groups in the European Union and across the world were furious about moving all of this area underwater. One of the things that was really, conf re really new to me as I started looking at dams was that question of what gets lost as you decide where to site a dam. Um, in this case, most of the dams from the Southeastern Anatolian project have ended up literally inundating areas that were minority areas, chiefly Kurdish areas. So one way to get rid of a population is to move them, to move them from where they had been living, um, 
to another place as their as their villages go underwater. Um, and that 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 uh, website that the students put together on dams was pretty mind boggling to me. I knew in theory what was what was happening with with the the uh, south southeastern um, Anatolian the Gap project, um, but I hadn't realized specifically what the consequences were and how clearly they'd been thought out. Here's another example. When the Aswan Dam was built in 1956, um, most of the people living along the areas that were going to be flooded were Nubians. Again, a really, really ancient city and really, really ancient part of Egypt, but not fitting in with a new nationalist notion of belonging. And one of the ways to erase a population is to put them underwater. Um, so this isn't the first time this Hassan Kaif, the loss of Hassan Kaif, um, but but dams, the the way governments cite dams is simply not neutral. Here's another way that dams are not neutral. Um, when Iran and Iraq were fighting this long, horrific war from 1980 to 1988, Saddam Hussein was worried that the southern Arabs who live in the marsh were really not loyal, that they were loyal instead to Iran. Um, and he worried that fighters could disappear into these marshes. Um, I'm not sure why we talk about draining the swamp as a good thing, but in this case, we have wetlands, swamps, marshes, that for centuries and centuries and centuries from before biblical times were where people lived. These Marsh Arabs, there's a terrific book written in the 50s by a fellow named Dessinger as he, as he uh, it's a travel log through the Marsh Arabs, through the Marsh, the marshes. Um, they raise water buffalo and eat water buffalo milk and they sell their reed baskets and they build reed huts. Um, Saddam Hussein decided to get rid of the marshes so he could punish the population, collective punishments, and track down anyone who was trying to hide in the marshes. And the results were catastrophic. Um, I'm going to talk about the school down the road again, but there's a fellow named uh, uh, Curtis Richardson at Duke who has been working for a long time trying to restore these marshes, um, and they've had some success with it. So it would be really interesting if you could get uh, Curtis Richardson to talk about restoring the marshes and this lifestyle, this, this livelihood that had completely uh, disappeared as a result of Saddam Hussein's wartime use of dams. Here's another dam problem, unintended, unintended consequences. The Mosul Dam was built by, again, Saddam Hussein. Uh, who really wanted this monument like Nasser had the Aswan Dam, Saddam Hussein wanted the Mosul Dam. And engineers warned him that the siting of the dam was going to be a problem because it's built on very porous uh, rock. And the warning was that the dam ultimately would, um, would have its foundation uh, dissolved by, by the water. Um, and he didn't pay attention to it, but for many years, people would, uh, engineers came in and um, basically injected large amounts of, of concrete under the dam um, so that the dam would hold. When ISIS was in charge for a couple of years, they didn't do that. And immediately after uh, the ISIS was defeated and left Mosul, um, there was panic around European capitals and American engineers because the fear was that when Mosul Dam, which was very precarious in the best of times, um, would uh, lose its, its structure, it would take out population all the way down to Baghdad. They were talking about a 45 foot tall wall of water that would um, leak an enormous amount of, of uh, the water, the river water, um, down into, along the river. And as a lot, what we know is that most of the population of Iraq lives along the river. So this, these were major population centers in the, in the, in the, 
in the path of this massive wall of water. Um, in the past few years, uh, engineers from various countries in Europe and the US have been working on building dams behind the Mosul Dam to try to hold back more and more water um, just in case this dam uh, it seems to um, be compromised in the future. Okay, so two things. We need water and there isn't enough of it. Human interventions in water are not neutral. Any questions yet? We've got so much wonderful chat happening uh, in the sidebar, Professor, and I've been watching it and sort of letting it flow, but you know, it does seem like you, you're really pinpointing two different uh, important takeaways just then. So let me, um, let me ask you to clarify that or perhaps just underline it as questions start to come in. Does water, in terms of the lens you're using it to, to, to look at and interpret and, and, um, and comment on this region, is it, is it an issue of scarcity? Is that the number one thing that our folks should take away? It's the haves and the have nots. Um, so I, I, I say, look at Las Vegas. Um, there isn't enough water in the Middle East. There are right. ways around not having wa enough water in the Middle East that involve really good care over the sorts of crops that are grown mm -hmm. and the allocation of water and the distribution of water. Um, and those are, are political policy decisions. They're not right. environmental decisions. Um, and, and I, I think that's really hugely important. One of the problems has been the change, climate change is making, is making things worse in this region. Um, right. but, the, but the other thing is um, a, a series of choices so that at one point in the 1980s, um, uh, USAID wanted Egyptians to stop producing lentils and onions and their regular food and instead produce uh, produce meat for the local for the for an export market so that they would have uh, hard currency and for their own market. Um, and I would leave ask the people who are here who know lots more about this than I do. What's the difference between growing lentils as your protein and mm -hmm. producing cattle as your protein in terms of the amount of water required? So part of it is intervention in a completely non environmentally appropriate way. I mean people know what can grow without irrigation. When, when I traveled in southeastern Turkey um, soon after, in, a, in 1996 perhaps, um, 2006 maybe, I've been there a lot, a number of times, I was shocked to see cotton growing in southeastern Turkey. This is a desert area where they were taking precious water resources to grow cotton in southeastern Turkey. Now, I know that growing cotton in northeastern North Carolina makes a whole lot of sense, but they were growing a crop not for local consumption, um, for export. It was an incredibly water intensive crop. So I don't think the question that what my students and various scholars have convinced me is it's not so much that there isn't enough water, but that people have to be really careful thinking about how to use water. And, and from what I've, uh, my sister lives in, in California and William is from California. So I'm constantly, every time I talk about water, I'm being told about droughts and almond trees and, and various things in California. And I think it's a serious issue there too. I mean, how, how when, when, there's, when there's finite amounts of water, what should they be, what should it be used for? Right. That's a great way to summarize the challenge. We've got a couple of questions that may be at least uh, nodding towards possible solutions. Eric, who's joining us from uh, mid-central New York, is asking if you can comment at all on the cost and the effects of desalinization. Um, can you speak to, to some other more scientific solutions? Um, desalinization has a number of costs. as um, is it Eric? Um, yes. I'd, be I'd be curious about, about his thoughts about that. 
in some places like Saudi Arabia and along the Gulf states, they have a lot of power and very little water. Um, so they've been investing in desalination and it's getting cheaper. Um, it's still a use of fossil fuels to create, to have water that they can then use to do things like make snow. Um, it's, the Israelis have been using it since the huge drought hit them in 2008 um, and not having an, uh, a local source of, of energy. It's it's quite expensive, um, but they're growing date farms in the desert with uh, with some desalinated water. Um, the other environmental cost besides the burning of fossil fuels to create uh, to, to create drinkable water is the is the salt itself. Um, as long as the oceans stay large and not too many people have extra salt um, that they have to dispose of, um, then it, it's not, that's not an immediate issue. Um, one of the things that made me think about the question of salt is the problem of, and I'm going to talk about um, Israel and, and the occupied territories here in just a minute, um, is the the problem with getting water into the southern part of, of Israel and Jordan. And one of the suggested possibilities was to create um, a red dead uh, canal of some kind. So to take salt water from the, the, uh, the Red Sea uh, up to the Dead Sea. Um, but the big problem is that, I mean, the Dead Sea is very, very salty as it is. Um, that's making it more and more, it's, it's shrinking as more and more evaporation takes place. Um, and, and, in, um, and the problem with, with piping that much salt water across the territory is potentially a problem in terms of uh, soil salination as well. Great, thank you. Um, this question comes from David. David's joining us tonight from San Rafael City Schools in Northern California. Dave is wondering if uh, there are any alternatives for the current dynamic of the nation state developing a disruptive dam or in intervention out there. Wow, that's a great question. How could, how could we um, make dams that are not disruptive? One of the things that my public health water daughter would say is that dams have to be really carefully planned, not only for the social policy implications in terms of inundating whole villages and, and populations. But also, once you dam water, the, the nature of the water changes. And what they found with the Aswan Dam is that new kinds of diseases became really prevalent as the water temperatures increased. Because you've got water that's stagnant behind a dam, those temperatures increase and new kinds of diseases show up. Um, well, the students were completely fascinated, and I can I can provide a, a, a reading about about that if your if your students are interested in in health and and medical issues. But the consequences for dams are so wide ranging. Is it possible to build dams that are positive? I think people have been doing that from the time we started talking about Mesopotamia. I mean, the 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 populations along these rivers often did dams and diversions on very small scales um and and it's there is there's this big ancient history dispute about whether it's necessary to have a central government in order to have irrigation or not and one of my professors decades ago in graduate school was one of the first to say you don't actually you don't need a central government to have dams it's counterproductive what you need is smaller units building their own dams not these massive nation state, you know, we've got an Ataturk dam and we've got a Nasser Lake and all these various, I think Assad has one named after him at this point in Syria, um, that we don't want these big, big dams may be the problem. Maybe that small dams are fine and big dams are not. And if there's somebody who does um, public policy and dams, or if, uh, if Katie is on here, I would really like to hear their answer to that. As a matter of fact, there is a an excellent scholar in Oregon right now, Kate Shield, who might be able to comment in the chat box. I appreciate seeing her join us. I do, too. <laughs> it's nice to shout out to your daughter. It's so nice that she came to hear your talk. 
Yeah. Uh, well, she uh, she got me into this. <laughs> So, uh, Professor, it's my job as the moderator to also keep us on time. We've got about a half an hour, so I see you've got one more big section. Why don't, why don't we get into that, and then we can continue to cue the questions. Uh, again, Kate, thanks for joining us. So, the question is whether we're going to have wars over water, or at least that's what the policymakers say. People from the UN have been predicting water wars. Um, water wars of the next century will be over water, not oil. Fierce competition for fresh water may well become a source of conflict and wars in the future. The next war in the Middle East will be fought over water, not politics. Um, so there's been all this drumbeat of if we can't figure out water, we're going to end up with uh, war. We're going to fight over water. Um, and then we have somebody I think I, I put in the, the readings, a uh, person named Wendy Barnaby, who said, no, actually, water is so important that we will never go to war over water. We'll use virtual water importing our food. It's never going to be a big problem. Well, as a historian, I want to argue today that not only will there be water wars. Well, I guess I can't say that as a historian because I only look backwards. But actually, there have been water wars. And the example that I use um, to make that argument is the 1967 war, um, the Six Day War, the June War um, between Israel and its neighbors. This was a shocking um, map for me. This was what the World Zionist Organization proposed at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919. Um, and this is the end of the quote and the, the uh, the map should take you to the original. The boundaries above, above here. Can you see the pointer? Unfortunately, I don't think they can see your pointer, so you might need to describe it verbally. Okay, the one on the left with the red lines. Though these boundaries are uh, outlined are what we consider essential for the necessary economic foundation of the country. Palestine must have its natural outlets to the seas and the control of its rivers and their headwaters. So the map on the left is roughly the same scale, and the green areas are the territories occupied um, in 1967, and um, the ones on the right are the ones that the Zionist uh, leadership in Paris asked for for the map of Palestine. They understood that it would be necessary for them, in order to control the Dead Sea and the Jordan, the Jordan River to have adequate water for their whole population. They needed to, to have both sides and the headwaters of the Jordan River. Oh my goodness, I lost my place here. Here we go. So fighting over water um, became a thing. Israel insisted on making the desert bloom, and the way they wanted to make the desert bloom was to take water from Lake Tiberias, which is where you see those red lines coming from, um, also called Kinneret or the Sea of Galilee, um, and, and moving all of that in a conduit called the National Water Carrier, that red line that goes all the way down into the desert. And the idea was they could make the desert bloom if they took water out of that lake and moved it into the desert. And they did that. Um, the National Water Carrier was completed by 1964. Um, at the same time, the, uh, the, the Jordanians did an East Gore project, which took water from the other side and a little bit higher in the Yarmouk River, um, which is on the Jordanian side of the, the, uh, the Sea of Galilee, Lake Tiberias, Kinneret, um, and moved it parallel to the Jordan River and down into Jordan. This was an agreement that basically had been uh, negotiated as the Johnston Plan of 1953. It was sponsored by the United Nations and backed by the United States State Department. And if you're interested in how U.S. history plays into this, it was the people of the Tennessee Valley Authority that were going to supervise this project. The idea was to create a series of dams to provide power and water for irrigation to both the East and the West Bank of the Jordan River. Um, both of these projects were completed, but Israel began taking lots and lots of water out of the lake and away from the Jordan River 
and um, the, uh, an Arab summit in 1964 decided to divert the headwaters farther up above that lake um, to prevent more of it from going downstream and being piped down to Israel's deserts to make the desert bloom. Israel claimed that this, uh, uh, this uh, diversion farther upstream infringed on its sovereign rights um, and estimated that the diversion would cost it about a third of the Jordan River water that they needed. Um, Israel from, from, uh, from 1965 on began attacking, uh, militarily attacking the uh, bombing into Syria as there were inc inc increasing efforts to do this water diversion further upstream. So most people who talk about the origins of the 1967 war talk about how uh, Nasser demanded that the United Nations troops, these red dots, um, be pulled away from the, the, the Sinai Peninsula. Um, they'd been put there since the war over the Suez Canal and the Aswan Dam in 1956. And the only real water that they talk about in the standard um, land-based narrative of the origins of the 1967 war were that the Israeli government said that closing the Straits of Tehran, which you see right next to the word Red Sea there, there's a little arrow saying Straits of Tehran, which controlled all uh, shipping into one of Israel's major ports at Eilat, the other ports are all on the Mediterranean, um, that that would be a declaration of war. And so Israel, won when Nasser closed the straits, instead of uh, demanding that the UN get the straits open, Israel attacked all of the uh, Egyptian air force before it uh, took off. So it's not only me that says that 1967 was a water war. Um, one of the architects of the settlement program, um, Ariel Sharon, who was uh, repeatedly prime minister of Israel, in an interview um, a few years ago, before he had his stroke, said, People generally regard June 5th, 1967 as the day the Six Day War began. That is the official date. But in reality, it started two and a half years earlier on the day Israel decided to act against the diversion of the Jordan River. While the border disputes between Syria and ourselves were of great significance, the matter of water diversion was a stark issue of life and death. And those are the kinds of language that we're hearing right now from um, from Egypt about about the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, that this is actually a matter of life and death, that losing water is a hugely important, serious issue for any country. It's not a coincidence that um, the, the territory that Israel took includes territory all the way to the Jordan River, where they could control at least one side of the Jordan River, and one of the areas um, that would be the West Bank and the Golan Heights, where many of the rivers that feed the Jordan River are, are connected. Um, there are some people that argue, and I will not, that the 1982 uh, invasion of Lebanon was also related to water. Um, but actually, Israel retained er uh, areas that they took in 78 and 82 for many years, including areas that could have been used like those areas in 1965 to 67 for water diversion. I think it's important to note that all of Israel's water is shared. All of the rivers are transboundary rivers like the Nile and the Euphrates and the Tigris. Um, that means that they start from somewhere else and control is always joint or disputed. Um, the lakes, as well, the Dead Sea and Lake Tiberias, Kiner at the Sea of Galilee. Um, I should just have come up with one way to call it. Um, those are also are sitting on shared borders. The Mediterranean and the Red Sea, the saltwater um, seas are, are also shared. The thing that makes me most pessimistic about the possibility of an end to this conflict, um, what you see on the right is the mountain aquifer, and on the left is the coastal aquifer. The territories that Israel took in 1967 are some of their most important sources of water. 
the West Bank sits on a massive aquifer um, that that Israel is currently using to make the desert bloom and to provide water for its own population. Al Haq is a uh, an NGO connected with uh, legal issues, and I won't read this out. I guess I will read this out. In the West Bank, some 300. 13,000 Palestinians across 113 communities are not connected to a water water network and are considered at high risk of water scarcity. Um, approximately 50,000 Palestinians in 151 communities live on less than 20 liters per capita daily, which is the minimum amount recommended by the World Health Organization for short-term survival in emergency and disaster situations. In stark contrast, the more than 500,000 Israeli settlers residing in settlements in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, consume approximately six times more water than the Palestinian population of almost 2.6 million people. In the Gaza Strip, more than 1.6 million Palestinians have only one source of water available, 90 to 95 percent of which is unfit for human consumption. So I want to suggest that. Water has been used in a very uh, deleterious way, ways that are really awful for certain populations, like the population of the West Bank, like the population of Hassan Kaif and uh, the Nubian villages along the, the Nile River. But that water can also be used in a remarkably positive way. And here's one example. What you're seeing here, here is a map of the Alexander River that starts on the West Bank and ends in the Mediterranean. And in the process, it crosses over um, Israeli territory um, with, from within the 48 lines, the green line as they call it. This, this river was filthy. It had industrial runoff, it had agricultural runoff, it had trash, it was not being taken care of. And the problem with transboundary waters are that if the person that is upstream from you messes up the water, it's messed. Um, there's no real way to to unmess it in your once it crosses the border. So what happened was that the Israeli government funded a cleanup operation on the Israeli side and the EU funded an operation, a cleanup operation on the uh, in the West Bank. And within a couple of years, the Nile turtle had returned to this I don't know why the Nile turtle is this far away from the Nile, but it was endangered. Um, the water has become clean, as you can see. This is a model for how um, populations that don't get along need to get along because of, of water issues. Um, that water flows and um, because of its fluidity, it's extremely important for people along its route to be able to uh, to get along over water. Let me give you one more example. We're back at this previous slide. Um, this is something that I talked about just yesterday with the uh, grad students, and there's a terrific film um, short video that the uh, that PBS did about the problems with water in Gaza. The problem with water in Gaza is that uh, Gaza has been under siege for many years. Um, all of the things that would have been helpful for sewage, for dealing with sewage, are not able to, to, to be taken into Gaza because the Israeli government says they could be dual use. So various cleaning agents and concrete and um, electricity, um, a very uh, electrical uh, implements of various kinds are not allowed in. One of the consequences of that is that sewage leaves Gaza. Um, into the Mediterranean, and the water from the Mediterranean flows north. So the the short video ends with this amazing picture of the the northern wall around Gaza, um, and and the the, the uh, map that shows how the so directly uh, directly to the north along the coast, there's a desalinate, desalinization plant on the coastal aquifer. And it's shut down repeatedly because raw sewage keeps entering the plant. So 95% of the water in Gaza um, that comes in through the aquifer is now polluted 
um, and, and unavailable for use. But it's not only the Gazans that are suffering. It's all of the Gazans and all of the people farther up the coast who can no longer swim in the beaches and whose water uh, purification plants are constantly um, uh, shut down because of the raw sewage. So one of the things that I want to leave people with is this very po positive future where people recognize that the very fluidity of water makes it not so good as a weapon of war, but makes it a terrific um, potential implement for peacemaking. And so I'd love your challenges. Well, that's a fantastic and very optimistic way to to, uh, to draw some conclusions. Um, I've got one question. This is from Alan. Alan's joining us tonight from Colorado. And Alan's wondering if you can address the question very simply put as, who determines use and allocation of water in the Middle East? Um, the governments usually determine to a, a large degree um, as my daughter pointed out, though, um, even though governments create at, at the, the policy at the local and regional level and um, implement water distributions at the local level, there can be lots of people who are tapping into that water um, without policymakers' knowledge and diverting it. But most, by and large, water is made. Water is made by a bunch of te technocrats, uh, water decisions, water policies. And it's fascinating that what, what I hear from people involved in these kinds of negotiations is that the technocrats, like from Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt, can all agree. And then it becomes a political football among the, the governments. Great. Thank you. Um, I see you've got a few more slides uh, still in your deck. Uh, would you like to cover those and then we'll conclude with a, a handful of questions at the end? Um, they're only really intended as questions, question answering. Oh, got it. got it, got it, I'm sorry. So, but well, I can't even want to see them. <laughs> well, this is a good chance then to invite our audience to, to bring forward some questions, particularly, I think, in the ways that it, you've referenced this several times, you know, being able to view this as both an historian and as an educator, as a teacher. Um, I, I'm curious, you know, you, you've talked a couple of times about the transformation as a scholar that you have gone through to to see water as and to use water as one of the, the primary vehicles to understand this region. Um, and you'll never go back. This will always be a part of your frame. Does the same thing happen with your students when you introduce water as the primary concept to them? Do you see that aha moment at the university level? I absolutely see that aha moment. I, it's just really astonishing, partly because it seems like this generation is so keyed to environmental issues. Um, but but they, they're really excited, uh, partly because water is something that's so understandable. Yeah. Yeah, on such a uh, such a human level, it certainly is. Um, I noticed early in the talk uh, tonight's conversation, you mentioned some of the ways that water is embedded and represented in different religions, which it seems to speak to, you know, there's the sort of the daily uh, physical need of water, there's the infrastructure need of water, but it seems too that there's a, a deep spiritual connection to water in this region. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, there's absolutely a deep spiritual connection with water. Um, in the Quran, all of the, the images of paradise are, are water filled. It's water gardens. Um, anyone who can afford to put fountains into, into a, an urban space for collective use or into their own, uh, garden for, for local use, it, it, water is, is, um, is just recognized as one of those parts of creation that's hugely, hugely important. Um, so one of the, I, I will certainly do some uh, these other um, maps. This, uh, what you're seeing here is Saudi Arabia. Like Israel, they wanted to make the desert bloom and they did it. This, I moved here from Kansas and this is one of those enormous um, round irrigated areas where they're 
that where they're basically pulling dinosaur water up to the surface. These are very long-term, millennial old um, uh, uh, water uh, aquifers that they're, they're, they were using to create their own food. And the reason they were doing that was because they really, really, really wanted to be um, independent in terms of food. Like the United States is concerned about our oil independence and our economic independence. Um, the Saudis were really worried that they would be reliant on others for food and that really drove them crazy. Um, so they were pulling up this water until it became really clear that they only had a few more years to go. And so what they decide to do then is buy other people's water. So the Saudis started buying land in Ethiopia and Sudan um, and, and starting to have their own farms produce water, produce, produce crops, produce food for Saudis in a new kind of colonialism. I mean, we think about the old kinds of colonialism with the British in India, and it was about um, importing, importing uh, raw materials and exporting, um, exporting finished products. But in this case, this is just about food, about basically importing water. Water is such an important issue for, for governments in the Middle East in general, um, that the Saudis, the Saudis are, are recolonizing the Horn of Africa. Mm. Uh, Alan would like a follow-up question. He's asking, uh, I wonder if you can answer, is there enough water conceptually from the Golan Heights in the winter to go south to Israel? I don't know that. Can somebody answer that? Yeah, we'll put that to the, uh, we'll put that to the, to the beehive of our audience for sure. Um, David can is also, I, go ahead. Anybody, I'm curious about how other people teach water. Yeah, please do uh, drop into the audience chat any other ways that you use water and integrate it into your teaching. Uh, David is asking if there are specific water projects in the Middle East that make you as hopeful as you seem to be. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, because uh, optimism can be broad and conceptual, or sometimes it can have specific examples, but... Um, it, your optimism seems, um, it does seem though to be grounded in some reality. What, what makes you so optimistic? It's, uh, the Israelis are not going to be able to tolerate not having pristine beaches. So they're going to have to help clean the sewage in, in Gaza. Um, just like there was a, it was necessary to clean up the Alexander river transboundary waters, either one of the things that's really fascinating to me about transboundary waters is that there's no real accepted international law about it. Um, so, for example, Egypt has always claimed the rights to use all um, water from the Nile, even though it's the last country on the river, whereas Turkey claims the right to use all water it wants to from the Tigris and Euphrates, even though it's the first country on the river. It originates there. So if the Turkey demand that water that originates in Turkey is all available to Turkey, then Ethiopia should be using all of its, uh, its, its the, the Blue Nile River and Egypt should be getting very little of it. Um, there's a lot of, uh, it's, it's really fascinating to listen to uh, um, Aaron Salzman talk about the negotiations over the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. He's been one of the negotiators for the U.S on behalf of the U.S. government that's trying to mediate this dispute. And uh, Emma and the Center for Middle East and Islamic Studies um, has, has uh, recorded a, a lecture for, with him where he talks about what it's like to become a diplomat and talk about issues with water and things like that. And he's very optimistic for the similar sorts of reasons. You can't indefinitely um, deprive a population of water. You can't make water filthy and expect people to tolerate it. Um, and and water is so essential. So I sound like Wendy Barnaby. On one hand, I can make the argument that water has occasioned war and has in big water projects created devastation for populations and still say, if there's going to be peace, water can be the vehicle. Mm. 
which is not to say as a historian there will be peace and water will be a vehicle. But if any of our students, and I'm still really counting on this generation, if any of our students think about trying to create peace, mm -hmm. water would be a really good uh, entree into the project. Here's a question that's coming from Lori. Lori is joining us from LAUSD. Uh, Lori's asking if with Israel's desalinization plants in effect, how have many other countries tried to get water from Israel, even though they're, in quotes, enemies? Israel's proximity to the Mediterranean Sea gives it more power to control water if it's desalinated. Um, Israel has no um, cheap energy, so it's not in a position to actually export water, it, 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 except in the form of, now remember that Israel, Israel's biggest, one of Israel's most famous exports, at least, is, uh, is citrus, which is very water intensive. Um, so Israel's not really in a position to, 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 to get rid of all the salt and send that, send it around. Um, on the other hand, I'm looking for an all for a map here. Um, these areas, um, especially here, they're doing an awful lot of desalinate, desalinization. And for them, they not only have a huge amount of water available, which is more than, you know, the, the Mediterranean water, but they also have still not, not an infinite amount of power. I mean, it is finite and it will disappear, but they are actually producing, they're, they're uh, taking salt out and using that for their own purposes um, and, and exporting some water um, around the region. The other thing to think about is uh, the FedEx Center on UNC's campus is doing this. The Israelis do a huge amount of it. What they do is clean um, sewage water to the point where it can be used for crops. Mm -hmm. And so they're doing a lot of water recycling. You've given us fantastic insights to the Middle East uh, tonight. Are you aware of any uh, scholar or organization that is, is taking these lessons learned and applying them to domestic issues around water, both challenges and solutions? What, what can we learn domestically from what you've described tonight? Domestically in the U.S.? Yeah. Yes. Oh wow! I think you've got a whole lot of experts on that in your in this in this group. I couldn't even begin to um, suggest things except that uh, I actually a few years ago was in the Rocky Mountain National Park and saw saw the uh, origins of the Colorado River, which has been so used and abused. I don't think the United States, as outside of California, is doing an awful lot to take care of our own water resources in terms of recycling or um, thinking about dams and consequences. Um, I moved here, as I said, from Kansas, which has the huge Ogallala water aquifer under it, which is being used to uh, feed cattle. So they're taking an area that can dry farm wheat and need no irrigation. They're they're irrigating it like crazy to to produce corn, which they then um, feed to cattle. Um, I am not a vegetarian, but when we think about water use, um, taking I mean grazing makes a whole lot more sense in western Kansas than than uh, corn uh, mm -hmm. feedlots do. So I think that there are lots and lots of, it's one of the things that's really fascinating to me is that we keep talking about water as though it's something that if we were to just take shorter showers, uh, we would fix the problem. But the problem seems to me to be in large scale commercial um, agriculture, large scale um, commercial mining um, and, and uh, big projects, not how much water um, you take in your shower, which isn't to say you should take three hour long showers. But, um, I think I think the pro one of the problems is that that I see water as a public good, as I saw some people in the chat at the very beginning talking about. I think that water is a public good. Clean water is a human necessity. Um, places like Flint, Michigan are now acutely aware of what happens when we don't care for the water infrastructure or when we're trying to not spend enough on the water that, that humans need. Um, that's not to say that none of those things are changeable. I think that, that they all are. And, uh, and it's our students that are going to make the changes. So thank you for your work.
And thank you for joining us tonight, uh, Professor Shields, leading the conversation and giving our teachers, our audience now, the kind of insights that they can go and integrate that into the conversations they have. Uh, Professor, thank you so much. Thank you. I want to thank all of our audience for joining us tonight. Please do follow the National Humanities Center and our social media feeds, both our Facebook and our Twitter feeds. You'll get updates on all of our uh, opportunities and uh, changes and, and new programs that we're instituting. Don't forget that we do have our Teacher Advisory Council application uh, currently open, and we'll be accepting those until May the 3rd. Um, I hope you join us at our next uh, webinar. We're going to be, uh, this is scheduled for March the 30th. We'll be joined by Heather Cox Richardson from Boston College. Uh, many of you may know Heather from the daily summary of contemporary events through the historian's lens. It's going to be a fascinating conversation, and I hope you can join us. Thank you again, everybody. Have a great day at school tomorrow, a great week. I'll see you next time at the Humanities in Class webinar series. Good night, everyone.